Welcome, friends, to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock flavoured podcast. On this show, Graham returns to Derry and Tom's as we look at a listener suggested book that fits squarely into our uncozy catastrophe category. When commenting on our Night of the Crabs episode a few months back, Paul Miles recommended Harry Adam Knight's The Fungus from 1985. As it happens, Harry Adam Knight was a pseudonym used by Australian author John Brosnan when he collaborated with British writer Lee Roy Kettle. Now, something Graham and I didn't pick up on was that Roy Kettle was not only a writer and fanzine editor, but in his day job as a civil servant, he was also a key player in Britain's 1995 Disability Discrimination Act. Go Roy! John Brosnan gets an entry in Clute and Nichols' ridiculously enormous Encyclopedia of Science Fiction. So I've risked my wrist bones to open it up and take a look. And it says, Brosnan John, Australian writer and journalist resident for many years in the UK, a one-time prominent member of rat fandom. He was known for his writing on genre films sometime before he began publishing SF in any quantity. His five books on cinema are James Bond in the Cinema, 1972, Movie Magic, The Story of Special Effects in the Cinema, 1974, The Horror People, 1976, Future Tense, The Cinema of Science Fiction, 1978, and The Primal Screen, A History of Science Fiction Film, 1991. The first three relate peripherally to SF, and the fifth is in effect a light-hearted update and rewrite of the fourth. Brosnan wrote most of the film entries in the first edition of this volume. He has also contributed film columns to Science Fiction Monthly and Starburst, and was for some time the lead book reviewer for the UK horror magazine, The Dark Side. Brosnan's first SF was Conversation on a Starship in Warp Drive, in Antigrav Anthology, 1975. His books under his own name began with the adventure novel Skyship, The Midas Deep. He then went on to publish the first of his pseudonymous novels, most written in partnership with Leroy Kettle. These written equivalents of exploitation movies are slightly self-mocking but quite exciting as SF horror, all of variants on the humans being destroyed by monstrous things theme. Those as by Harry Adam Knight include Slimer, 1983, Carnosaur, 1984, by Brosnan alone, The Fungus, 1985, variant title Death Spore in the US, and Bedlam, 1992. Those as by Simon Ian Childer are Tendrils, 1986, and by John Brosnan alone, Worm in 1987. The initials of the pseudonyms were no accident. Torched, 1986, with John Baxter, both writing as James Blackstone, is about spontaneous combustion. Brosnan reserved his own name for a more ambitious work, The Sky Lords Trilogy. The Sky Lords, 1988, War of the Sky Lords, 1989, and The Fall of the Sky Lords, 1991. These consist of fast moving adventures in a post Holocaust society after the Great Wars remorselessly evoking another SF trope every time the action flags, everything from mile-long dirigibles to computer guardians of ancient civilizations. Mmm, John Brosnan has passed me by, and I may well have to start exploring some of his back catalogue. Now, this Harry Adam Knight pseudonym didn't escape the notice of David Langford in this characteristically acerbic and humorless contemporary review in his critical mass column in White Dwarf, where he said, the fungus is a horror nasty veneered with scientific rationalisation for a dreaded cross between dry rot and athlete's foot, which causes people's favourite parts to suffer spongy outgrowths or fall off, as when a rapist's fungus-riddled organ snaps at the crucial moment. Truly revolting. Even the authors are ashamed and skulk behind a pseudonym. Hmm. It appears Langford may have been a lone voice in this, however, as Clive Barker said, I had a damned fine time with this book. Brian Aldis said, I loved it, and you'll find that it will grow on you. Carcass reviews opined, loud, sick, and scary fun. You will never again go near mushroom soup. And the greatest British horror author, Ramsay Campbell, called it a spectacularly gruesome nasty, written with inventiveness, grisly wit, and considerably more intelligence than almost all of its competitors. Hmm, that'll do for me. Langford did have one point, though. It is a bit fruity in places, and it does feature one incident of attempted sexual violence albeit with a willy dropping off along the way. So, content warning? Somehow, despite this being really square in my wheelhouse in the 80s, this book entirely passed me by until Paul made this recommendation. But now, it's firmly in our eyeline. So join Graham and me as we fire up the Spartan and head into spore-infested England to check out... The Fungus. <laughs> Oh. Oh. 
We're back at Derry and Tom's, and welcome back, Graham. Hey, Andy, how's it going? Uh, it's going very well, thank you. And we, of course, we're here. Well, we'll talk about what we're here to do shortly. But first up, what have you been up to? Ah, uh, well, all sorts, really. I, I, as as someone who has multiple hobbies, I've, <laughs> I've been occupying my time as best I can. Um, so I've been I've been making walking sticks, which you can see behind me. Oh, um, in my nice. in my shed. Um, Obviously, other people won't be able to see that. But yeah, but yeah I've been doing that as a, as a sideline, um, putting them out on the street for charity. Yeah. And people can Brilliant. just donate. Donate. Um, I've been making a, a card, another card game. Um, and stuck that up on Kickstarter, mm. uh, which is, I don't know how, how well that will go, but it's been an interesting experiment with um, uh, large language models and chat GPT and yeah. seeing how I can utilize that to sort of help me. Um, augment my sort of lack of writing skills uh, mm. so that's that's been an interesting one um, and work and kids and family mm. Mm. so tell us about the kickstarter then what is the card game the card game many years ago in my misspent youth i was into phone freaking and hacking mm. and you know this was sort of early 90s and i recently sort of revisited a lot of the um literature i was reading then uh, so things like uh, there's a great book about uh, called Cyberpunk, which is three stories about different hackers around mm. the world. So there was um, Pengo and the German hackers of, of part of the sort of Chaos Computer Club. Um, there was Kevin Meeknick, uh, a classic uh, hacker from America who was really notorious. And um, also a guy called Robert Tappin Morris, who created the first sort of official internet worm mm. um, that went out of hand. And that got me thinking about a card game around cyberpunk, early cyberpunk hacking, 1980s, 1990s hacking uh, inspired game. So I was thinking about it and then I thought it'd be ideal to use ChatGPT to help me with that. Hmm. So I put in some ideas, some prompts, and it came back with some ideas for the rules. I sort of tinkered around, manipulated it a bit. Um, and then it came out with, I think, quite a convincing game. Uh, hmm. So... Um, I worked with that and I got it to sort of create some prompts to sort of feed into some image generation and and got some quite interesting sort of isometric uh, pixel art type stuff out yeah. of it. Um, so, yeah, so I thought let's let's create a, a card game out of it and see how that goes. Hmm. It's called uh, Cyber Jockey uh, Mainframe Showdown. Hmm. So, again, that was a chat GPT title that it came up with, yeah. which I thought, yeah. Quite, quite a good yeah. title. Yeah, um, I must say, yeah. I, I back to your last one, the um, Duck Pond Sailors card game. Yeah, I'm ashamed to say, I still haven't played it because I don't have any drunk people around me <laughs> to actually play it with. But our friends Stu and Sarah are here over the weekend, so I might, I might dust it off and yeah. pull it out and and have a game this weekend to see how we yeah. go. So, Give yeah. it a go. Yeah, learn yeah. some shanties. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I've I've backed the uh, the Cyber Jockey um, Kickstarter as well, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, let's, so, let's see how it goes. Yeah. So where are you on, because of course you are really our resident Guy and Smith expert, um, where are you We are Guy and Smith collection building and what have you been reading by in recently? Yeah, so I've slowed, I've got a, a big stack of Guy and Smith stuff at the moment, so I slowed down, but there was one book that I was really after hmm. and I couldn't find it anywhere, uh, which was called, the title was ridiculous, The Pony Rider. It's his um, it's his western, um, which I he think he really did everything, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's his his attempt to do something like Edge or something yeah. like that. Um, and I managed to get it for I think it's about five pounds. Um, and it was from America, and it was dirt cheap. Yeah. Uh, so I was I was amazed by that. So I've got that. I haven't read it yet, but that's on my shelf. But recently, I've read um, Alligators, which was very very slim. It was about caimans, really, rather than alligators. But I guess caimans as a title isn't as good as alligators. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> and um, it was quite good, actually. It was it was very sympathetic about these escaped alligators ah. and the, the fact that um, these stupid humans are trying to kill them, and you know they're just trying to survive in this um, unfriendly alien environment. There's this vet who's kind of like the uh, the um, Cliff, but I forget his name in the, in this. But he's he's a vet, but he's not. Yeah. He's not as good as Cliff. Does so. he smoke a pipe? No, but he's got a beard. It's just Guy uh, and Smith as they yeah. always are. Um, yeah. But it it was a good book, good read. There's some yeah. fun bits in it. 
Um, and then the other one I've read recently was Warhead, which I think you got you know halfway what? through. I got halfway through it and I put it down and forgot to pick it up again. Yeah, and um, yeah, that is bonkers. Yeah, totally bonkers. It just it, that's one of the maddest books I've read. I think by Guy mm. and Smith. I need to finish it off, but the, just some of the slight cultural insensitive stuff I found a little bit overbearing. I yeah, it, it it certainly is isn't. Yeah, it's, yeah, absolutely. Mm. But the but the plot is just bonkers. It's bizarre, and there's some really strange things that goes on in there. Um, I'm not entirely. The, the end is just yeah crazy it's kind of worth reading just for the ending because hmm. there's yeah there's just imagine a village disco <laughs> <laughs> a village disco and nuclear war <laughs> so not not only is it about voodoo and nuclear war there's a village disco in it as well yeah, yeah. you see now so, you're selling it to me i've got to pick it up and finish it yeah. i've got to pick it up and finish it despite my misgivings yeah. about some of the language and uh and i'm currently reading i've just started reading uh manitou doll which is an interesting one it start, starts off um starts off in sort of the 1800s in america uh with sort of native americans fighting um you know the the the, the americans yeah. soldiers and again, he's very sympathetic to the Native Americans. I think he, I think he was a big fan of uh, Native Americans. Hmm. Um, but there's there's a sort of a, a, a horrible deed is done against a, a, a female um, Native American, and that's the premise of the story: revenge in, yeah. in the future. And and it's a it's about a a doll that causes carnage within a, a basic a fun fair, and it's out. I think it's. In in the UK, so it's somewhere in some village in the UK, a fun yeah. that just goes horribly wrong. So yeah. could could be interesting though. That sounds great, actually. And when when you mentioned it, I looked it up, uh, and it's like rocking our shit. <laughs> it's yeah. really hard to find. And I must say, I did think my first reaction was Manitou by Graham Masterton was really really successful. Did guy yeah. just think, oh, <laughs> I'll get on this bandwagon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably, uh, probably did. You know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I really want to read the uh, the Manitou sequels, but funnily enough, switching briefly over to Graham Masterton, we were in Markham last week. We were taking our rippers in Markham, and of course, we went in the old pier bookshop in Markham, but also the Carnforth bookshop, where I actually ended up buying a lot more stuff up the road um, from Markham, which is an absolutely fantastic bookshop on three floors, stunning collection of all sorts of pre-50s hardbacks, all sorts of stuff, really fantastic, and a really, really good sci-fi fantasy and horror collection um but i from the only book i bought from the old pier bookshop was um channel house uh, by graham masterton which looks to be thoroughly entertaining and i think that's going to go on our halloween list for when we put that vote out in the next month or two for what we do for halloween this year um so that might end up a copy of that might end up coming your way graham <laughs> nice nice sounds good yeah um, and, but we're... also we went to um the market in Markham, and they had an absolute ton of latter day Graham Masterton crime thrillers. Oh, which he, yeah, he went down that line further on and started just writing crime thrillers. And uh, and Phil, I think Phil got about four or five of them. So I'll be interested to hear what Phil thinks of Graham Masterton's crime thriller outputs. Yeah, no, that'd be good. What was that? Because you sent me a Masterton that we haven't, I haven't read yet, and we were going to, you were going to read. About, it's about the pig or something. Oh, of course. Of course, yeah. yeah. I forget the name. Well, yeah, we've got to do that then, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for one of these horror novels, that's quite a chunky one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. But I think we should definitely cover it. I can't even remember what it's called. Yeah, and when I bought that, I got that from the old Pier bookshop, funnily enough, in really quite tidy hardback. And um, I'd never seen it before. And then about five days later, we dropped off some stuff at a charity place on Kirkstall Road in Leeds. And they have books in there, three for a quid. And there was another one in there in the three for a quid section. I didn't pay a, I didn't pay thirty three p for it in the LP bookshop. I can tell you, uh, that that's the one I ended up sending you. And I've never seen it since, and I'll probably never see it again. Both really pristine hardbacks. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I think it's fair, it's yeah, fair yeah. that we have to actually cover that book. Yeah, that's so, sitting on my shelf. So yeah, mm, give me the nods and I'll get get onto it. Yeah, we'll do that in the autumn. I think. Yeah, good, good. But of course, we're not here to do Guy and Smith. We're not here to do Graham Masterton either. But before we get onto our book of choice, I need to grab a beer. So what's your beer of choice this evening? Well, I've got – I'm not drinking beer, actually. I've got a, cider, a cider ah. from, it's from Aldi's. Yeah. 
Um, but I've also got from all these, which I, I couldn't help buy this. It's a snake in black in a can. No. What? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. This is such a weird coincidence. Such a weird coincidence because today I was thinking, I can't find any mushroom beer. Because really, oh. if we're doing a book called The Fungus, I was thinking, I need something appropriately thematic. And I've only ever seen a mushroom beer once in my life, and that was in Manchester, and it was a mushroom sour. Yeah. And it was in a beer hall in Manchester. I was there with, who was I there with? I was there with John Bradshaw. Hello, John Bradshaw. Shout out to John. I was there with Yaki. Yaks, shout out to Yaks. And we were in this beer hall in Manchester, just going along the keg beers. And it was one of those places where you have to really study the chalkboard that the right thing's on. Because I thought, I said, does anyone have tr- anyone fancy trying this mushroom sour? And they're all like, you're fucking joking, aren't you? <laughs> so I said, well, I've got to try these things, haven't we? So I went to the bar and when it was my round, I thought, well, I'll get everybody a mushroom sour, but I'll also get them something nice as well. And I said, can I have, uh, I think three or four of us, I can't remember, can I have four mushroom sours, four pints of mushroom sour? And he said, pints, you do realise the pints are 17 quid. I was like, what? And on, and on the board, it was like five pounds something for a third or yeah, four yeah, pounds yeah. something for a third of this mushroom sour. So I said, okay, four thirds of mushroom sour and four pints of whatever Scratty John's Bitter or whatever the hell it was. And uh, they didn't like it. Um, but I like sour beers. I like Lambics. And this mushroom sour, I thought, was a really interesting beer. So but none of them liked it. They all thought it tasted like sour bog water. So I got to drink it all. I was really happy. Yeah. And even when I was drinking it, I was thinking, I've just drunk a, p- a pint and a third <laughs> of mushroom sour that cost me about 20 quid. Probably one of the more expensive beers I've ever bought in a beer all, to be yeah. honest. But it was all right. But there was no way I was going to be able to find anything like that. And even going up somewhere like um, the Optimist in Geisler, which I've mentioned before, or Rainville Superstore um, over in Leeds, they're both fantastic beer outlets. Nothing like that on their lists online. I thought, if humanity is battling fungus, I'll have to go with Battle Lager. So I was in Aldi today, and I thought, even better, I can drink cheap knockoff Battle Lager. So I'm starting off with Saint Etienne, Aldi's <laughs> Aldi's nice. cheap Stella knockoff. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So Etienne. <laughs> yeah, so that's my kickoff beer. Yeah. Saint Etienne. Yeah, yeah, let's get this cracked. I kind of thought this this snake and black would be perfect um 80s vibe. Well, I wish I'd looked harder now because yeah. I didn't spot them. So yeah. that's that's my fault for not really looking harder, isn't it? Snake and black. So what is I'm assuming it's like it's either snake bite or cider and black. It's a a classic I can't read that. I can't read that word. It's it yeah, it's it's cider Lager and blackcurrant. So it's literally snake bite and black, yeah, ready yeah. made in a can. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Oh, I feel like I really missed a trick there now. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to hear what it's like, and I'll probably be paying Aldi a visit tomorrow because <laughs> I've got my mate Stu and Sarah over for the weekend, yeah. and uh, yeah. I think if I launch some of that, um, it'll it'll make for yeah. a very interesting weekend. It's only four percent as well, so yeah, good session drink. Yeah. Oh. Can't wait to hear the tasting notes. <laughs> right, battle cheap knockoff battle lager. Here we go. Yeah, it just tastes like cheap knockoff lager, to be honest. But it'll do. It'll do for now. I've got an interesting backup also from Aldi for next time around. So we are here to cover the fungus by Harry Adam Knight. Now, why are we here to cover the fungus? Well, YouTube listener Paul Miles six zero one two. Hello, Paul. When responding to our episode, The Dark and the Nature of the Uncozy Catastrophe, mentioned this book, The Fungus, and said, have you ever read it? It's a cracking read. So, of course, I dropped you a line and said, we've had recommended a a catastrophic Britain is fucked book about fungal infection, not athlete's foot, although there is some athlete's foot that goes wild (laughs) in this book. (laughs) Which is brilliant. Um, So, Paul, thanks for the recommendation. So we're going to tie this into our ongoing exploration of the very British Uncozy Catastrophe and give it a read. So, of course, normally we talk about our covers stroke editions, but I think we're both in the same boat here. We've both got the Valancourt edition, which is uh, still in print now. It was brand new when I bought this off eBay. Orange cover and a very, uh, quite a nice illustration, actually, of... Um, the clock tower at Westminster, covered in weird fungal growths. Yeah. That said, I do feel it should have been Telecom Tower, yeah. given given that yeah. it plays such a prominent role, or Post Office Tower as it was there. Post Office Tower, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
given as it, it it took such a, a prominent role in the story. Yeah. And uh, there's a there's a, a stand first on it a review from Brian Aldis that says the fungus is excellently bizarre. I loved it. It will grow on you. Aha, see what he did there, Brian Aldis. <laughs> so let's have a read of the back. When a brilliant scientist seeking to solve the problem of world hunger tries to create giant mushrooms through genetic ma- manipulation, what could possibly go wrong? The mutated spores escape the lab and spread across all of England. Toadstools grow to 20 feet tall, and a case of athlete's foot can mean a grisly and horrible death. But those who die quickly are the lucky ones. Those who survive infection by the fungus will be transformed into something unthinkably monstrous. I take issue with that statement, but we'll we'll get to that. With a perfect mix of nightmarish horror and black humour, Harry Adam Knight's cult classic, The Fungus, will grow on you. This edition features a foreword by the author. Now, I've got to take some kind of um, issue with that statement. They'll be transformed into something unthinkably monstrous. What we'll find as we go through all the vignettes is some pe- people die in all sorts of strange ways, depending on the specific type of fungus that's involved. And it does go into quite a little bit of detail, doesn't it? They obviously did yeah. the research on uh, on types of fungus. But actually, the people who survive, when they do come across them, they're a bit like the mutants in the Omega Man. <laughs> they're not really unthinkably monstrous. They're horny. <laughs> They're hardy and they want to sacrifice people to the mushroom gods. Not really unthinkably monstrous. I don't know what you think. No, I, I, there was sort of a tameness to it, was wasn't there with the, with the uh, the adversaries? I felt. Yeah, I think some of the books that we've talked about, which were written around about this time this was written, were a little bit more hardcore and nasty. And while this is entertaining. Um, I suppose we kind of skip it to the end, but let's go. Yeah. While this is entertaining, I expected it to be a lot more gonzo yeah. than it actually was. Yeah. You know? yeah. That said, it follows a fairly familiar pattern, and it has some truly entertaining moments, which uh, which we'll take a look at. So let's go. Let's talk about it. Thanks, for Paul, for the recommendation. Um, but Harry Adam Knight, first of all, is a pseudonym for uh, books written by John Brosnan, who was sadly departed, he died in 2005, and Lee Roy Kettle, also known as Roy Kettle, who wrote the intro to this book. And it kind of blew my mind that in the in the opening notes, it tells us that John Brosnan wrote the novel Carnosaur. Yeah. Now, I'm familiar with the three cheesy Carnosaur sort of Jurassic Park Raptor knockoff movies, Carnosaur, Carnosaur 2 and Carnosaur yeah. 3. I had no idea they were based on an English novel. So now I need to track down the Carnosaur novel because those films are a guilty pleasure. Most of but, Have you seen them? I haven't seen them, but I didn't realise that the novel came out before Jurassic Park, didn't it? Did it now? I believe it did. I think it was like a couple of years before. Ah, well, in terms of the films, they were definitely a response to Jurassic Park. Raptors are scary. Let's knock out some really cheesy, cheap and cheerful raptor horror films. And they used Carnosaur as the basis. And I must say, I've not had a chance to track down the Carnosaur movies and watch them again since we said we were going to do this, but now I feel I have to. And these fellas both wrote a book called Slimer under the Harry Adam Knight pseudonym, and that was filmed as Proteus in 1995, which I haven't seen. But I watched the trailer earlier, and it looks amazingly rubbish. <laughs> and it's got the Craig Fairbrass seal of quality. So nice. I now feel I've got, I've got to track it down. I've got to see it. But sadly, no fungus, no the fungus movie ever. Although, again, in the intro, uh, Roy Kettle explains that he was approached by a Hollywood producer about the possibility of a film. But I don't think it ever happened. But mm. all I am going to say on that score is The Last of Us may well have taken fairly liberally from this book, or it was an entire coincidence that some kind of experimentation on mycelial organisms resulted in a plague, an infection, which basically destroys the world. Strange coincidence? Don't know. Despite the fact that I enjoyed the series, I haven't played the games, in all honesty, although we said we would like this to be more gonzo than it actually is, I think... Turning the fungus infection just into basically zombies with growths on them isn't actually as interesting as how the infection works in this book. I think the book could have handled uh, maybe a little bit more 
drama, action, whatever you want to call it. It was a very quick read. It's almost a one shit book. This it's yeah. not far off. It's I think the the TV series can't talk the the um, the games, although it's pretty faithful apparently. I think doesn't handle the infection. I think zombies are done. The TV have you seen the TV series? I've not course? seen it. No, no, I, I a, should do. Yeah. It's a really good series, but the zombies are the least interesting thing about it. It's good because you've got a good core performance from a couple of great actors who have great chemistry. And as usual, the real monsters are us, which is just basically what zombie films are all about. Yeah. It's just It just so happens that the zombies are created by a fungal infection and they're not properly dead. They're just taken over by fungus. Whereas in this, the fungus either makes people blow up... <laughs> In one case, does all sorts of weird things to them, or it turns them into ravening, strange cultists who worship mushrooms, which I think is a bit more interesting. Yeah. But yeah. when it comes to the book, what we're we talking about, so it's split into three parts. We've got part one, the spreading, part two, the journey, and part three, which has no subtitle. It just kind of all rattles to a close fairly quickly in part three. But part one is mostly in classic form, a series of sometimes fairly in-depth vignettes that introduce uh, a character, give a brief explanation of their circumstances and or relationships, then tells us how they die horribly, (laughs) which is quite entertaining. And I'll ask you which your favourite of these deaths is in a moment. But we've got Norman and Nora Lane. Norman, classic uncozy catastrophe archetype. Emasculated, frustrated husband with a wife he considers to be a harridan. He gets all his frustration out by woodworking. And there's a lovely reference to him caressing the wood sexually. Uh, Nora, on the other hand, thinks he's a pathetic loser because she has no sex life with him. To avoid her, he went round to the rear of the house. At the back door, he warily listened for sounds of activity in the kitchen. Hearing none, he quickly entered and scuttled on through to his workshop. He gave a deep sigh as he switched on the light and closed the door behind him. What meagre enjoyment he got out of life was almost all in this room. The cared for tools, the books of woodwork designs, the finished and half-finished projects, and the lengths of untouched timber with their distinctive aroma. He felt a momentary spasm of annoyance that he could not continue with his main job, but there was so much else to do that the room soon exerted its uplifting magic on him, and he found an equally satisfying alternate task, the extra-fine sanding of an unfinished cabinet. He began to caress the already smooth wood with the fine paper. It was a soothing, almost sensual feeling. He would never have made any sexual association with what he was doing. Sex, in fact, had always been low on his list of priorities. But to any objective observer, it would have been obvious that he was making love to the wood. As he rubbed, stroked and caressed, the tensions of the day began to drain out of him. So Nora's up bed, upstairs in bed, pissed on Sherry, wondered... Not really bothered that he's not there, but she realises the following morning that he's not there. So she goes to find him. She goes down to his workroom. As she opened the door, she tensed, ready to retreat at the slightest sound. But she heard nothing. There was, however, a strong, musty smell. Emboldened, she stepped inside and almost screamed. Although I've kind of got a bit ahead of myself there, because there is an amusing bit where she thinks, is he dead? Has something happened to him? The idea didn't alarm her. Life without Norm would be ideal as long as the finances were all right. She wasn't sure about the finances, but if something had happened to him, if he'd had a stroke or a heart attack, she ought to find out as soon as possible. The sewer was taken away the better, before he started smelling. <laughs> She'd heard that the smell of dead bodies was the hardest of all to get rid of in a room, even with the strongest air freshness. <laughs> That's just fucking fantastic. But anyway, she goes in, she sees a strange mould. Dry rot, she thought, as she stared at it with horror. She loathed the stuff. It had been so expensive to put right in their first home. Norm had shown her the fairy yellow and white fungus that had eaten up the floor supports and then pushed her hand into it as a joke. She shuddered at the memory. But this growth was much bigger and thicker than the one she remembered. It must have been growing in here for years. The floor, walls and ceiling were coated with the soft, disgusting stuff. It had also grown over what must have been shelves and cupboards, but were now shapeless forms under the mould. And the smell. It was so bad, it almost made her gag. Why had Norm let it grow, especially in here, his precious inner sanctum? Then it occurred to her that it might have grown very quickly. In fact, it seemed the only likely explanation. Perhaps it had been grown under the floorboards or behind the wall for ages, 
and had just suddenly broken through during the night. Yes, that would explain why Norm wasn't here. He must have gone to get some stuff to deal with it. Some of that fluid that caught in the back of your throat and stank the house out for days. Well, this was his responsibility, she told herself. And the sooner he got rid of it, the better. It was disgusting. She picked up a length of wood and thrust it angrily into one of the bigger mounds of fungus. Unexpectedly, a ripple ran through the growth. Then the whole mound moved. Even worse, it spoke to her. Nora, it said in a thick muffled voice. Nora, it's me. And before she could react, Norm reached out with two soft, slightly sticky arms and hugged her for the first time in years. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. So first, straight away, we get the sense that actually the fungus doesn't necessarily kill you. It can just turn you into something strange and unnatural. I was going to say that's quite poignant at the end there, isn't it? Hmm. There's a bit yeah. of a moment. Yeah, I, I think that is up there with um, the pigeon episode <laughs> in, uh, in the, was it the Fog or the Dark? I can't remember. I think it was I the Fog, which one. Yeah, yeah, the Fog. Yeah. It's, it's up there. Nice, <laughs> nice little bit of um, poignancy <laughs> in the relationship between two adults where it's completely broken down. Yeah. And one of the things we also find in that is when he is heading home, because he's initially we found out that he's super frustrated for a number of reasons. One is some black youths are playing music too loud. Two, he hates his nylon shirt that she makes him wear. Three, he spits and a young copper tells him off. And four, he bumps into a blonde, attractive lady who then hurries off. Ah. Uh. Well, the blonde lady is a common theme through all of these vignettes, and we'll find out who she is eventually. Next up, another common archetype in these kind of books, Barbara, a frustrated lesbian <laughs> with her own relationship issues with her partner, Shirley, an annoying homophobic neighbour upstairs. And <laughs> the end of this one is uh, is another e- interesting example of uh, of where we go with this. So... After having a, a disagreement, after getting um, rather angry with each other, after Barbara was checking out an attractive blonde woman at the cinema, hmm, what a coincidence, they get down to it. Barbara savoured the thrill of being so completely exposed to Shirley's cruel, hungry gaze. Barbara closed her eyes as Shirley knelt on the bed between her splayed legs. We'll probably have to put a content warning on this, won't we? Yeah. Then she gasped with pleasure as she felt the warm wetness of Shirley's tongue probing the lips of her vagina. The tip of the tongue then moved up to her clitoris and she gave a low, shuddering moan, arching her back as the first pulse of pure ecstasy throbbed through her body. All thought of the attractive blonde woman in the movie theatre had fled from her mind. Much later, sated and exhausted, they fell asleep in each other's arms. But during the night, Barbara had a horrible dream that she was choking. She struggled into semi-consciousness, but the choking sensation was still there. Her mouth and throat seemed to be filled with a soft, fairy substance. She tried to come fully awake to cry out, but she found herself falling back into unconsciousness again, an unconsciousness that led to a much deeper oblivion than mere sleep. When dawn arrived, she was still lying there in Shirley's arms. They were joined at their mouths by a pale, yellow, pulpy mass. Neither of them was breathing. The venereal fungus which had grown at an accelerated rate through their bodies during the night, and killing them in the process, was visible at their other orifices too. It grew between their legs to form fairy yellow diapers and covered their ears like huge fluffy earmuffs. <laughs> and they were both dead. The fungus grew on. Oh, good Lord. Reading between the lines, the infection has sent thrush crackers. That's what, yeah. we're, that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. So already, we've, um, it didn't take long to get into the strong sexual content that is also a common theme to these kind of books. But there's just something a little bit different. I, I think I prefer the direct language rather than moist triangle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But then I don't think I don't think these authors are trying to be they're not trying to be sort of sexy or anything, are they? They're, they're just no. sort of setting scenes. Uh, yeah. and and it's more humorous. Yeah. Yeah. That that is absolutely a key difference. James Herbert and the others of this world, Sean Hudson is another good example. We haven't covered a Sean Hudson book yet. I'll probably put slugs on the Halloween list again, just to, yeah. just to give it a chance. They really do seem to try and write it like some kind of weird erotica, but it just doesn't work. No. It, it might work if you're 13, 
and I'm sure it probably did when I was 13, but re- reading it now, you read it back and it's just, it's mildly embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, this is just much more straightforward, direct language, which I, I think I prefer, even though yeah, it's, yeah. it's a little bit explicit. Yeah. No, um, what does um, James Herbert, it's always about triangles. Is it curly triangles or something? Yeah. Um, I think he's used moist triangle in, yeah. a, in a number of different <laughs> scenarios. And, and always thighs. There's not no thighs in this. No reference to thighs. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, I'm quite grateful for. Although there is a lot more fruity action mm. as we go through, some of which took me by surprise. But we'll get to that. Who else have we got? We've got Derek. We'll rattle through these. I won't read these out. But we've got Derek Lang, a knobhead customer in an Indian restaurant who, who the waiters hate. And he's the guy with athlete's foot that takes a turn for the worse. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's been putting preparation PA on it or something. Yeah. There's a bit in there where where he's kind of proud of his athlete's foot because <laughs> it, cause it makes it makes it seem that he is athletic. <laughs> <some extent>. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, he's a fat guy. He was this <laughs> kind of strange mis- misapprehension that athlete's foot means he must be athletic. <laughs> but actually, yeah, yeah, that ends up killing him. Uh, pub landlord Eric Gifford with a yeast problem. <laughs> And the fungus takes hold of the yeast in his stomach and he essentially blows up to enormous size and then all his staff hear him explode. (sighs) And, of course, we have the blonde lady that's common to each of these vignettes because the blonde lady was in the pub, the blonde lady was in the Indian restaurant. So she's like, she's the infection vector who's carrying this all around. And we find out that she is Dr. Jane Wilson and she is the source of the infection. And once again, they seem to have done their own work a little bit around some of the technicalities about this stuff because we get quite an extensive chapter which goes into detail about the experiments that she's doing. But basically, what are the experiments about? She wants to create a superfood to feed the world. Um, I think by the end, we find out that her motivations have changed slightly. But at this stage, she wants to create a superfood that will save the world. And then finally, for part one, we get the perspectives of a couple of doctors, one of whom is, is it Bruce Carter? I think it's Bruce Carter, yeah. Bruce Carter, yeah. And his colleague, who were working at an A&E, and infection victims are coming in, turning up, and sadly, it kind of generally goes ill for them as well. So we've got this lovely establishing part, which sets the scene in London and tells us that London is rapidly succumbing to this infection that's killing people, that's in some cases turning people into weird fungus monsters, but ultimately... It's a big, big problem. So London looks fucked. So we've got our brilliant Britain is fucked set up, which is great. We love a bit of that. So in part two, part two is subtitled The Journey. And we meet our hero, question mark, question mark, question mark, Barry Wilson. Hmm. Opinion about Barry changes as the book goes on. But he, we find out he's an author of thriller stories about tough Northern Irish detective Flannery. But he is also the ex-husband of Jane Wilson and a former mycelial something a fungus doctor, mushroom yeah. doctor himself. And he's been writing his book. He's not. He's got no radio, no TV. Has no idea what's going on. We know that it's maybe a week or so later, and he's picked up by the army, much to his consternation, to go and join. Long story short, a small team to go and track down his ex-wife and their research, along with a v- couple of other characters, a dodgy alcoholic sergeant called Slowcock, and a lady scientist called Kimberly. And I think it's fair to say that a strange lust triangle develops amongst these three, and it doesn't really go as one might expect. <laughs> it certainly took me by surprise. Yeah, Slowcock... When you think of those conversations that you would have if this was actually happening, who the fuck thought Slowcock was a good idea (laughs) for this mission? You know, England is succumbing to a massive fungal infection, which is destroying everybody, taking over the island. You're at a point where the French Navy are destroying boats and planes that try and leave the island to stop it from spreading. And you pick Slowcock... (laughs) And there is there is a reference at one point. It says the pick Slowcock because he's this kind of man. Yeah, because he's prepared to kill, but he's basically an alcoholic psychopath. Yeah, it is. But it's yeah, it's a bizarre choice, isn't it? You, it's not as if he's an action hero that mm. 
that can get get shit done. Yeah, he's, he's just a complete psycho. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a balding, short, alcoholic sergeant with little man syndrome who regularly breaks people's jaws and puts them in the hospital if he takes a dislike to them at the office at the, at the staff mess or whatever. So yeah, not the best choice. Why is Kimberly there? Remind why is Kimberly there? Well, we find oh, out later. Yeah, she's the one who's going to administer the hideous yeah. cocktail of drugs that will hopefully stop them from getting infected. Yeah, yeah. So um, they spend a couple of days getting this stuff injected into them and basically puking non-stop 48 hours, which sounds deeply unpleasant. So they've got this mission. They've got to cross to the mainland and try and make their way to London for a couple of reasons. One is to try and find Jane Wilson and her research. There's also a mention of Jane's research assistant, who we find that Barry Wilson has some kind of history with at some point. So that's the idea. And of course, because it's one of these books, we get our next um, patented feature of these kind of books, a battle bus struck truck, which I think is referred to as a stalwart. And I yeah. probably should have gone online to look up a stalwart to see if it's an actual proper military vehicle, but I couldn't be bothered. But they refer to it as a stalwart. And it's hermetically sealed. They've got an airlock. It's got mounted machine guns that can be controlled remotely from within. Sounds great. And, of course, yeah. we've seen this before, haven't we? We've seen they had battle buses in the fog and the dark, which, frankly, were hugely disappointing when it came to, to them actually getting used. And in this case, much like the James Herbert books, it's a bit of a letdown and probably far too easily rendered useless. And but it does last a, a bit longer. Lasts a bit longer, but there's a there's a point where for them to um, refill it with ammunition, the the uh, machine guns, they have to get yeah. out of it, yeah, and put on a suit and get out, and then which just seems bonkers. That's right. Yeah, they've got to reload on the outside. Yeah, and as it turns out, I think. Don't the airlock get knackered in no time anyway? Yeah, yeah. Um, so everything everything becomes... Really, nobody has ever topped the land raider in The Cursed Earth, the Judge Dredd story. That's the ultimate battle bus. Okay, it's a little bit damnation alley. Whatever. But, you know, you get these battle buses in these in these things. Um, also reminded me a little bit of Doomsday, the Neil Marshall film. And yeah. actually, the fact that... I think the bits in Doomsday were the... Scottish people who they don't expect to come across end up making them crash. It's a little bit similar to what happens here. It's just yeah, fungus-infected yeah. people crash. But anyway, before all that, we get a video, another video about a family of campers and their parents, Dermot and Sally. And we get another different example of how mutated fungi do their thing and even get a little extract from the fungi's perspective, which I quite enjoyed. So let's have a look. Dermot's a bit pissed and he gets into the sleeping bag. He's checked on the kids. The kids are fine. He's almost tripped over their tent. And he gets in. He says, it's only me. Sorry, possum. I'm a bit sloshed. She muttered something he couldn't decipher and unzipped the slipper, unzippered the sleeping bag apart of the way to make room for him. He crawled in with difficulty. She was naked and felt warm. There was a slight slickness to her body that fresh perspiration gives. It felt very good. And it began to get hard. Now, it's a common theme in this that if people get sweaty, the fungus is straight in there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Straight in there. He caressed her smooth skin and she reacted swiftly with the responses of a sexually aroused but still half-awake woman. They made love with all the pleasure of their early days together. Later, as they slept, a thick orange growth slowly formed outside the tent. It was looking for food, having already depleted the organic detritus in the soil. It quickly detected the presence of a large supply of warm food nearby. Its thin hi-fi, which would have been almost invisible in daylight. I don't know if that's hi-fi or hi-fair. Hi-fi sounds like a stereo, so that can't be right, can it? Yeah. It's thin hi-fi, hi-fair, fucking hell, whatever. It's thin hi-fair, which would have been almost invisible in daylight, spread out over the ground towards the heat source. They moved swiftly, covering over 12 inches every minute. The end of the tent spread across the grass towards the ground sheet and the end of the sleeping bag. During their lovemaking, Dermot and his wife had emerged from the bag and were now sleeping on top of it. The tips of the hyphae touched their damp feet and began to feed on the dead outer layer of the epidermis. As they grew further up the sleeping couple's legs, the hyphae sensed a food that was more natural to the coprophilus fungus. They grew faster and were soon probing the warm crevices on orifices that were particularly moist and nourishing. 
they entered Dermot and Sally almost simultaneously. All the sleeping couple felt was a dim sense of increased warmth. They both relaxed into it, and their dreams were pleasant. At one point Sally became half awake and stroked Dermot's chest. His skin seemed to have a thick fairy texture to it, but she knew that was only because of the strangeness that sleep gives to the senses. It felt wonderful, she decided, as she sank back into deep sleep again. In the other tent, the children were being similarly invaded by the fungus, and entered into the same peaceful state of union with it. The mutating Coprophilus was making the necessary changes to its hosts, so that it could exist in symbiotic relationship with them, without causing their destruction. When the Biggs family awoke the next morning and saw what they had become, there was no adverse reaction. Some brief moments of bewilderment, but that was all. Then they began their new life, no longer needful of tents, books or clothes. From now on the fungus would take care of all their wants. They wandered out into the meadow and got down on all fours. The grass tasted especially good at this time of year. Oh, oh. that's so pleasant and pastoral. Isn't it? Yes. It's what a sweet. way to yeah. What a way yeah. to lose all of your you know worldly worries. They're probably the people who come off best in this entire book, to be honest. Yeah. But I really, really like that those couple of sentences. At one point, Sally became half awake and stroked Dermot's chest. His skin seemed to have a thick, fairy texture to it, but she knew that was only because of the strangeness that sleep gives to the senses. I really like the way some of this stuff is written. Yeah. It's really, it's really good. I love it. But anyway. It's certainly a better end than exploding from massive yeast mutation overload <laughs> in a pub cellar. So yeah, it's good. But anyway, Slowcock, Wilson and Kimberley to head off on a quest through England in their battle bus. Style work for military nerds. And as these things tend to go, bus doesn't last that long, but it lasts longer than it has done in other things. But what's the mission? The mission is to find Jane Wilson and her research. But before they actually get underway, there is another really amusing vignette about three socialists from Hastings <laughs> which is truly fantastic it, it, f fantastic in a way in that it's actually quite comical particularly in the way it starts where it says the Hastings branch of the International Socialist League was called to order it consisted of three people Comrade Henderson was in the chair Comrade Snell was taking minutes and Comrade Blakey made up the rest of the branch under other circumstances the branch would have been bigger but considering the particular and peculiar situation, three was a pretty good turnout. Comrades, said Geoffrey Henderson, his shadow jumping about on the sandstone as the candle flickered. We have a crisis. All three of them were well aware of the crisis, but as usual, Geoffrey was intent on going through with the formalities. Sheena Blakey listened with only a fraction of her attention, partly because she knew what he was going to say and partly because she was wondering which one of her two comrades was going to want to demonstrate his solidarity to her that night. The previous night she had been obliged to accommodate both of them. After arguing over whose turn it was, they'd had a vote to spend the normal <laughs> rotor system temporarily. Sheena had lost by two votes to one. <laughs> she had a similar suspicion that there'd be a vote tonight. I, I get the impression that these writers either are socialists <laughs> <Yeah>. and know <laughs> people like this, or they've certainly come across these kind of people in the pub. And it's, it's, very, um, it's very Rick the People's Poet. In yeah, terms yeah. of you know house meeting and having a vote, I, I really was like um, this. I was listening to the audio version of of this chapter, and uh, what's the guy? I forget the guy who did did the voiceover. Something Pringle, Ian Pringle, or something like that. Yeah, but he 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 did some very good voices for them, and it <laughs> it really set the scene of these sort of real sort of nerdy whiny men. It was it was brilliant. Yeah, it it reads like uh, uh, an early eighties Ben Elton sketch in places. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's entertaining. But we do find that they are complete sniveling cowards uh, because they run out of food, and then they they have a vote on who should actually go out of the cave to get more food, and the both vote for her, <laughs> and she just says, "No, I'm not going. What are you going to do now?" <laughs> So one of them has to go, and it all goes wrong anyway. And she ends up basically on a run in there, goes to bed in the sleeping bag. He's like, "Oh." Peace at last, <laughs> because they've both been absorbed by fungus at the cave mouth. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah, really interesting. And, and that to me is the equal of anything in any of these books, just in terms of amusement value. Yeah. And I do sometimes wish that James Herbert would take his foot off the gas a little bit and do something a little bit more wry 
you know, a little bit more wry and humorous rather than just the, the constant viciousness yeah, of his yeah. earlier books. Uh, but yeah, it's it's good stuff. Meanwhile, our our heroes are traversing England from the coast. There's some nice explanations of them passing despondent refugees who show more and more signs of infection as they get further inland. They have a battle with some fungus people who initially mistake them, who they initially mistake for soldiers, although there is a nice bit where they actually avoid real military units who are making for the coast in an attempt to escape England. But of course, our team knows what awaits them, and we know what awaits them. These these desperate soldiers who are banding together with their equipment and with their na- their nous and their know how, um, we know that that torpedo shells or bombs care of the French navy or air force is what awaits them. Love all these little details. Love the atmosphere it creates. The the old Britain is fucked business never gets old, yeah. and I always enjoy that kind of thing. Rogue military units out for themselves are always good value for money when it comes to the random encounters table in these kind of things. And I, I, I do think sometimes I need to kind of factor more of that into when I'm running games, even if I'm running fantasy games, just, you know, have random encounters with... Well, actually, I did have it in one, and, and it does feature a little bit in Volume 1 of the Journal. Yeah. Dodgy City Watch, you know, getting up to no good and butchering civilians, which originally in Volume 2 or Volume 3, they would have caught up with them, but I went off on a wild tangent that's just ended up becoming Volume 2 and Volume 3. But those Sarbrook City Watchmen will get their comeuppance at some point, yeah. probably in Volume 72, when I get around to writing it in 35 but, years. But the, as you mentioned, it, this does <clears throat> this does run as a good campaign, right? The, oh, the, yeah. The, the whole book. Like, it does. It absolutely yeah. does. This would make, uh, as, as much as any of these books would, yeah, yeah. this would make a really fantastic... Um, alternate game of Twilight Two Thousand or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, not that I would use Twilight Two Thousand or any of those rule sets. I'd be lazy and just use something simple. But for those kind of, you know, the world is ending kind of games, especially when they've got that distinctive British feel like this has got. Love that stuff. It would make a really great game. Now, we do find as well through all this combat that Wilson has a very brief period as a pacifist who refuses to use the guns. But it doesn't really last very long at all. And he gets really miffed and gets particularly upset. And this is what changes his entire demeanour and turns him a little bit more hardcore when Kimberly, a scientist, ends up in a particularly horny and rough sex tryst with short little man syndrome, bald alcoholic Sergeant Slowcock, <laughs> which I honestly didn't see coming <laughs> at all. <laughs> Not only do they end up getting it on, they get it on in a particularly rough way, and they're both up for it. And again, the, the book is very, very matter-of-fact, and there is no judgment whatsoever on the female character in this to say that she likes a bit of rough in the form of Slowcock, and she actually thinks Wilson is a bit of a fanny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which, I, which I thought was really amusing. And, and actually, it does, again, make this book very real compared to some of these other books we've been reading, yeah. where... Yeah. You know, the female character is basically there to be creeped on by the main character, be he be a bearded, pipe smoking, you know, scientist or a school teacher or a civil servant or whatever it is. The women purely exist to provide some sucker to the main character. In this case, she's like, this main character's a dickhead. Yeah. I like this rough, alcoholic, knobhead sergeant, and I'm going to have a bit with him. Yeah, very entertaining. But the most amusing part is when Wilson's sulking in bed in the main part of the battle bus, because after they've had this big encounter with these fungus people and the machine guns and the, the bus has been damaged, Wilson's sat in the bus sulking while she's gone out with Slowcock to fix the truck. He comes across like a complete and utter wimp at this point. But there is a suggestion at one point where it says that, um, you know, he knew how these things worked. He wrote Detective Flannery, after all. <laughs> <laughs> There's this brilliant bit where he's sulking in bed and Kimberly and Slowcock are again at it like rabbits in the cabin and boozing because Slowcock seems to have a ready supply of whiskey with him at all times. And he, he's got infected and the entire back of the bus fills with an orange mould while they're roughly servicing each other up front. But because they're taking this crazy cocktail of drugs and chemicals as protection, he survives... The only side effect being he loses all of his body hair, all of his clothes, and is stained orange for the rest of the book. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's a great image as well. It actually reminds me a little bit of um, 
the bit in From Beyond where Jeffrey yeah. Coombs gets swallowed by the big interdimensional worm, transdimensional yeah. worm, and loses all of his body hair. And that's, yeah. From Beyond, of course, similarly horny. Yeah. <laughs> that's this and I, book. And I think that's that's one aspect of this book compared to Herbert and, and um, the others is that humour in it. Yeah. You know, that it, it is funny, right? It yeah. Has, has these scenes that are just ridiculous, but really funny. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it is a good read. I read this again. I read this one with Markham. I think I read it cover to cover. Started it in bed one night and just finished it the following morning uh, because it's just so breezy and easy to read, but it's still, it's, it's not, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I've been reading the survivalist book one. That's easy to read, but it's trash. Yeah. <laughs> right. This is easy to read. This is entertaining, but it's not trash. It's knowingly wry and humorous and sort of weird and gross in places, but it doesn't devolve into cynical nastiness no. in the way that a James Herbert or a Guy in Smith book might do in order to, you know, f- fill that genre space. Yeah. This does it in a, in a much more uh, knowing way, and I appreciate that. Even though I think I wanted it to be a little bit more gonzo than it actually is. I did appreciate that about it, and it does make me interested in reading things like Slimer yeah, and Carnosaur yeah, for a little bit more. But that's a great image, the fact that he's completely bald. And we get on to part three. doesn't have a subtitle, but essentially they make it to London. They try and find Jane Wilson's former lab assistant. And I suppose we'll have to decide how much detail we're going to into the end or whether we want to spoil this for people. Because I think when we're talking about things like Mocock books and other books, you know, there's there's elements of... People have often read these books and we're just kind of talking about the content and passing our thoughts on it. There is there is something at the end of this book that I think is so amusing in terms of it coming out of the blue. I think if you read it again, you might kind of put your finger on the fact that it might be possible. But anyway, I'll get to it. So the battle bus finally comes a cropper when they encounter organised resistance from fungus people. And it is a little bit like Doomsday. I mentioned that before. And they're now on the streets. And these people are... It's a bit. It's all a bit Doctor Who. They get captured and escape because they're being tied up because all these fungus people believe that normies or whatever um, are actually, you know, to be despised and they must be infected and become part of the whole. Slowcock turns out to be the rascal we knew he was all along, leaves them behind, pisses off with a gun. Doesn't work out for him, bless him. But I do love his reaction to when he starts growing weird fungal tendrils <laughs> out of his bonds. <laughs> It's absolutely brilliant. There's just this little passing reference to him saying, oh, oh my, I, I seem to be developing a fringe. <laughs> and, and it makes him feel younger and more virile. Yeah. <laughs> and he, 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 does, uh, he does pop up again. And essentially, the reason he feels more virile is because the fungus has not only entered his brain and his consciousness, but he's got all weird fleshy tendrils growing out of the front <laughs> of his head, which he thinks is his youthful head of hair that's returned. <laughs> it's fabulous. Yeah. It's fabulous. Yeah. Kimberly almost gets raped by fungus men because, of course, it's doomed London, so people have got to get rapey. It just seems to be part of the part of the landscape. But one of our characters from Chapter Chapter One shows up to help them, and it's Bruce Carter. Doctor yeah. Bruce Carter has retained his intelligence and is attempting to keep on top of his research. Good old Bruce, and he was aware that they were actually coming, so he's there to meet him. And I suppose. Long story short, well, short story short, really, because part three really does rattle to a close particularly quickly. We get our Omega Man bit where the the infected people stroke mutants. I'd like to think they're all wearing sparkly silver capes and sunglasses, but but they are, they're all just fungus people. You know, they want to give them to the fungus god or whatever. And it turns out that Jane has a cult of hardcore female supporters at Post Office Tower, who they basically butcher... <laughs> on their way up to find Jane at the top. And when they find her at the top, she looks rather normal. She's got a big laboratory. She's doing her research, but we find out her motivations have changed somewhat. She is now all about the Earth Mother, and the fungus is the manifestation, the living manifestation of the Earth Mother. And actually, I'm just trying to remember, part of the credo, the credo part of her, her creed about this Earth Mother is that women now will rule the world for the on behalf of the Earth Mother. Jane has turned into this strange 
feminist superwoman who's gathered all these women around her to protect her research to ensure that the Earth Mother can take the world and restore uh, an order and get rid of the old world order. And after they've butchered and set on fire <laughs> all, all of her, her female uh, protectors, they get to the top and we find out that he asks about the children and she says, oh, yeah, they're fine. <laughs> but they're not because she's just experimented on them and turned them into <laughs> into fungus creatures as well. Yeah. But she looks completely fine and perfectly normal, which is a bit of a... Why is this the case, we wonder, at this point? Now, should we spoil the reveal? Should we spoil the ending? I suppose I, we always do with these things, don't we? Yeah, I said, I yeah. Do, should we spoil it? It, it? it all happened very quick for me. And I, it, it came as a bit of a shock. Yeah, it does um, happen very, yeah. very quickly. So I guess, spoiler warning, if you want to read The Fungus, skip forward five minutes. But if you don't want to read the fungus and you just want to hear us talk about it, stick with us. I'm just gonna I'm gonna try the snake and black. Oh yeah, uh, that's that's a good point actually. I am going to I'm not going to have battle lager on this occasion, even though I have got a spare battle lager. My other pickup from Aldi today is the Hop Foundry Watermelon Pale Ale, oh, okay. brewed in partnership with Seven Brothers. Yeah, the the, the snake and black is a Hop Foundry. I yeah. guess that's just just Aldi's. Oh, how does it smell? Oh, very ribenery. Oh, oh! I'm really upset. I missed it now. Although it's probably absolutely packed with sugar. Yeah, That's too nice. much. Too it's much sugar. Bit, it's a bit sweet. Yeah. This one says this beer is summer in a can. An infusion of pressed watermelon combined with a strawberry and pineapple aroma creates this truly thirst-quenching craft beer. Now this could go one or two ways. This could be, you know, a hint of watermelon, or it could be just pretty bloody awful. But, you know, let's find out. We we have ended into a situation now where when we said, um, if you don't want a spoiler, skip forward five minutes, people will skip forward five <laughs> minutes just to get to the end of us talking about our beer and then yeah. hear the spoiler. <laughs> oh, well, never mind, eh? Yeah. You win some, you lose some. So they're in this situation where Wilson, Barry Wilson, I almost called him Harry Wilson, is a little bit fed up of this entire situation. He's realised that his kids have been sacrificed to the Earth Mother. And let's have a look. So she says, uh, Jane gestured at the fungus clinging to the outside of the window. This is her blessed manifestation. All around you, we are in her womb. Jane, he said gently, that stuff is poison. It's killing people right across the country. It has to be stopped. She gave him a pitying look. For a time, I didn't understand either. When it began, I thought I'd done something terrible. But then the Earth Mother showed me the truth, that I was the instrument chosen by her to transform the world into her image, to bring about the, the end of man's evil domination of the planet and allow the Earth Mother to regain what is rightfully hers. Jane, the fungus is causing suffering wherever it spreads. There is always pain at the time of birth, but once man has been cleansed from the world, the Earth Mother will protect and sustain her children. We will become one with nature instead of fighting against her. There will be no more hunger or pain. We will be enfolded and nourished by her forever. I see, he said softly. It was hopeless. Unable to cope with the enormity of what she had unleashed, her mind had become completely unhinged. She had convinced herself that she had somehow achieved her original objective, that her fungus would end world hunger. And what is this work you mentioned that you had to finish? he asked. I must find a way of overcoming the inhibiting factor that is presenting the fungi from sparring. I must also alter the fungi so that the few unfortunate people who resist infection will be able to succumb to the Earth Mother's embrace. He nodded, maintaining his outward calm while his blood turned to ice water. And have you had any success yet? I am close to solving the sparring problem. I feel sure of it. She indicated a row of incubators that followed the curve of the outer wall. And when I have succeeded, I will take the new spores to the roof and release them into the air. They will also include the new genetic factor to enable the fungi to embrace the few who are naturally immune. That problem I have already solved, though I need to conduct further tests to be certain. But with the help of you two, the whole process will be speeded up. So, of course, we also find that she's conquered the problem of immunity because Barry is immune. And by his genetics, his son was immune 
but no longer, because she's conquered that and infected his son. The other side of the cabinet was transparent. It was filled with something soft. Jane tapped the glass. The softness moved. In the midst of it, a pair of eyes suddenly opened. They were bright blue. Our son, said Jane proudly. Wilson stared into his son's eyes. They stared back imploringly. There was, Wilson saw with horror, still intelligence in them. In a strangled voice, Wilson said, And Jessica, what have you done with her, you murdering bitch? Jessica is fine, answered Jane, sounding puzzled by his reaction. She is happy within the embrace of the mother. She guards this sacred place with the rest of my followers. I'm surprised you didn't see her on the way up. (laughs) Wilson dropped the nozzle of the fire extinguisher. It fell to the floor with a clatter. A bit of typo there, fire extinguisher. It's a flamethrower. Of course. (laughs) Of course, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Hmm. It fell to the floor with a clatter as she spun round to face Jane. Jessica was among those creatures, he screamed. She gazed at him him calmly, her expression self-satisfied and smug. All will be clear to you when the mother finally takes you into her embrace, she told him, and gave him a beatific smile. He slammed his right fist into her mouth as hard as he could, followed through with all his weight. He expected to knock her unconscious. He didn't expect her head to fly from her shoulders with a dry snap. (laughs) Kimberly screamed! (laughs) Headless, Jane's body tottered in front of him. No blood spurted from the end of the neck. Instead, green fluid began to trickle out. He could see her whole body was riddled on the inside with fungus. And, yeah, so, Kimberly Spears, uh, end of Jane. End of Jane. So, yes, a real supply. And uh, he then turns the whole place to fire with the the, uh, the flamethrower and they burn it all down. (laughs) The end. Almost the end. Almost the end. Because before the end, we've got to find out that after his last, he finally does get a rumble in the sheets with Kimberly, only to find out she's got an orange growth behind her right knee and she dies two days later. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Bruce Carter, bless him, helpful to the end, also suffocates overnight, whilst of the following days, um, Wilson is waiting to be rescued. But the, and also, there's a. A weird reveal about why Kimberly really was on the mission to try and save her parents who were in prison in Africa. And oh, she wanted that's to right. use it as some sort of blackmail or something. It was it was just a bizarre. I'm that's not right. Sure her parents why. are some kind of weird political South African. What was it? They're some kind of political activists in South Africa yeah, yeah. or something. Yeah, and they're in prison, and she she went on the mission to get that's the. Right. To get the um, the cure, so then yeah. she could get them released, yeah. which is just bizarre. I don't, I'm not sure mm. <laughs> why that was in it. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd forgotten that already, just because it just seems so throwaway. <laughs> yes, of course, there is a little reference earlier on when she's still nobbing Slowcock about how she's got a hidden agenda. Yeah, and when they finally reveal the hidden agenda, it just it's a little bit random <laughs> and yeah. does doesn't tie into anything else that's going on. Anywhere else in the book. Yeah, so that's completely and utterly undeveloped. And at the end of the day, she gets taken over by orange fairy fungus anywhere and killed. So she never gets a chance to do that anyway. No. It's it's a bit of a uh, slightly disappointing ending in terms of she died. Okay, she dies. Bruce Carter dies. Fine. But then he's sat on a roof, an RAF plane turns up, and then in the background post office tower succumbs to the fungal infection and just collapses and then he realises that the, it says something like he realises that battle against the fungus will be won and he threw the empty wine bottle into the air and I don't know, that, that ending doesn't really kind of match the tone of the rest of the book, it's all a little bit convenient it's like hooray, hooray we won because yeah, yeah. H- how on earth are they going to stop the fungus? Because the fungus is still there, it's just like he just the book ends and he has confidence that they will win. But there is actually no established solution to it other than the fact that they stopped Jane Wilson and not, and he punched her head clean off. He, he does get her research, though, doesn't he? He does, yes. Yeah. He does. So, yeah. But, he does. Okay. It, yeah. yeah. But it was... Uh, I was I was wondering how they're going to end it. <laughs> I just didn't expect him to punch her in the head to pull off and she died. <laughs> 
put, punch the Red Queen <laughs> off her shoulders, and then for Kimberly to run her through with a spear. Yeah, that's yeah. it at the end. Yeah, <laughs> almost. But I, I do like the reveal that he basically burned his daughter, <laughs> climbing yeah. the tower, fighting all these fungus women. Burned his daughter to a, to a cinder. Yeah, and, it, oh, no. it, and his son's just a cube. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. But, yeah, it doesn't suggest that he actually takes his son's tank with him, does it? He <laughs> no, just, just, just leaves him behind and purse off his tower to be crushed when it collapses. Yeah. Uh, but, oh, well. But I, I, with the post office tower, all I could think about was uh, Good Morning Kevin. Yeah. That this, much as I enjoyed this book, it's missing a Good Morning Kevin moment. Yeah, yeah. But that said, all of the books that are the fog are missing a Good Morning Kevin yeah. moment. <laughs> The end of the day. Um, what it made me think of was uh, the goodies when post office tower collapses because there's giant cats growing, yeah, yeah. climbing up it. Yeah, but on the whole, a good recommendation from Paul, a thoroughly enjoyable book for me, and and a good addition to that Britain is fucked, uncozy catastrophe kind of um, milieu. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I when I when I started it, I wasn't quite sure where it was going to go. Mm. But after those sort of vignettes, and then they were on that mission, it, it, there was just elements of it. It's the humour, the sort of the matter of fact, descriptive sex scenes that I thought yeah. were refreshing in that sense, where it wasn't trying to be, you know, readers' wives or anything like that. Yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah, it didn't just, read like a reader's letter. Yeah, in yeah. Fiesta. Yeah. And um, and there's just some the detail actually, the fungal detail was interesting. Always yeah. it referenced. Loads of different fungus and and things like that, and um, yeah, re- enjoyed it. It was, uh, but I definitely want to read another one of his thing, or theirs as it, as it is. Yeah, well, we've got we've got a, a few options now, haven't we? Because we've talked about doing is it flesh flesh and the Grey Master book of the pig on the cover? Is it flesh? Fuck, I can't remember that book. We've talked yeah, about yeah. that book. We've talked potentially about. We still haven't done crabs on the rampage. Crabs on the rampage, which yeah. we've got, we've got to do at some point. But I do, I do kind of want to, I do want to read Slimer and Carnosaur. So yeah. yeah, maybe, maybe at some point we should read them and decide if there is any merit in uh, in talking about them on here, or whether we should read yeah. them for fun. Because yeah, of course, yeah. what I need to do is change my mindset and stop thinking that everything I read <laughs> has to be a potential subject for this podcast. Um, although we do have a uh, potential. One shit book candidate, which I did pick up in the old peer bookshop, and there's a reason why it's a one shit book candidate. And uh, let me just find it. Here we go. It's called the Munich Involvement mm. by F- by Frederick Mullally, and it's by Pan Books, and it's got a wonderful Pan photo cover of oh, yeah. a, a partially naked babe. With I Like Bob written on her torso, the eye slap between her boobs, and the back reads, the review from The Spectator reads, readers should be warned that the book is both politically and sexually mature and must be read at a sitting. Well, that is essentially instructing us to read it as a one-shit book. And the description is, Bob Sullivan, roving correspondent, has two specialties, women and trouble. One usually leads to the other. Probing the background of a ruthless neo-Nazi movement in Bavaria brings in plenty of both. So does clashing with the party's plans to recover Hitler's hidden store of gold. His one-man blitzkrieg attracts plenty of women, a warm brunette, a curvaceous nurse, a randy redhead, and a golden nymphomaniac. Not forgetting Heidi, who started something Sullivan almost left, unfinished and the evening standard said sex and sadism with a topical background racially told so <laughs> uh, and I, I hate to tell you this graham but when i picked it up from the old peer bookshop i instantly knew that we had to do this as a one ship book and bought another copy oh well you, you managed to find two copies of it oh yeah i found a second <laughs> copy on it on an ethic on a book since it's arrived <laughs> So I am lucky. I tried to convince Phil that we should do it as our old peer bookshop special, but she basically told me to fuck off. 
<laughs> she's not interested. Um, and I, I don't want you to think that you're like, you know, the, the, the third in line as choice. <laughs> but I tried to sell it to Natasha as well because Tash got in touch last week and yeah. said, so, you know, when are we going to do a podcast? She knows that I'm still off currently. She said, so while you're off, are we going to get a podcast in? So I said, I have just the thing. And she told me to do one as well. <laughs> when, so I, I don't think she was interested in sex and sadism with a topical background, racially told. Okay, fair yeah, enough. I can understand enough, yeah. why. Yeah. But you know what? I just, I just feel that there's some entertainment value in this book. And apparently Sullivan has a, an original adventure, also in Pan, called Dance Macabre. But oh. fuck it. I don't mind leaping. I mean, at the end of the day, we're Danis 4. We didn't start with Danis 1, did we? <laughs> Fucking Danis. Yeah. That is also a potential option. Yeah. Looks but, interesting. I, I like that. I like Bob. Yeah. It's a strange one, isn't it? Yeah. I like reminds, Bob in lipstick. Yeah. yeah. It's, it reminds me of the you know, Church of the Subgenius, Bob Dobbs, all that sort of stuff. You know what? It's going in the post here. Yeah. <laughs> ASAP. Um, I just need to share. Even if we don't cover it, I just yeah. feel like I need to share the love when it comes we, to this book. Have you dipped into it yet? No. No, I haven't. Because when we were on holiday last week, um, but my reading recently has been, because I read The Fungus and then Miles on Discord was talking about um, 2010. Yeah. I think it, I can't remember if they watched or read 2010 Odyssey 2. And we just had a, a brief exchange and I said, um, I haven't read it for Donkey's Years. I think I read it when I was like 20 or something. But more recently, and I say more recently, I'm talking 15 years ago, I'd read 2061 Odyssey 3 yeah. and 3001. And I dimly remember 2061 being quite a decent, easy, quick read. And it was. It was a really easy read. But it wasn't that good, actually, on revisiting it. Because it's basically, who's the main character from the Doctor from... Two, Hayward Floyd. Yeah, yeah. It's basically Hayward Floyd goes on a saga cruise to Haley's Comet. And while at Haley's Comet, they get redirected to uh, to go out and, and help a, 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 a mission that's in trouble that his son is involved with. And the only really interesting stuff related to the monolith sort of happens in an epilogue. Right. And that's the stuff I wanted to read about, like the next... Uh, anyway, so I've got 3001 kicking around as well, but I haven't picked that up yet. So I read 2061, I read The Fungus... I read something else, and I've already forgotten what it is. I've started reading The Survivalist, which is just throwaway, nonsense yeah. throwaway trash, but quite entertaining. You know, Third World War is happening, and the main character is a survivalist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, of course, because it's called The Survivalist. So his entire perspective on this is he's got to get his family away to his bunker that is built in Pennsylvania or whatever. And this guy, it starts off, and he's helping some... Um, Pakistani military police deal with drug dealers, uh, drug runners, when Russian forces from Afghanistan flood through the, fiber pa uh, the Khyber Pass to invade Pakistan, and the Third World War starts to unfold. But you've got this character who, every single reference to when he pulls a gun, you get a, a particular description of what type of gun he's using. <laughs> so in, in holsters under his armpits, he has two... Detonics 45 compacts. He has a six-inch Colt Python on his hip, which also he can rechamber for 22 Longfire, just in case, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I was, it was so funny. I, I was reading it. I was thinking, what the fuck is a Detonix 45? I know what a 45 is. You know, I know that much. Yeah, yeah. But I looked it up, and Detonix was a company that started doing these compact 45 pistols. And this guy, I'm reading this article. It's some American gun nerd who was writing a review of a Detonix 45. And it turns out that Jerry Ahern, who wrote the Survivalist books, ended up becoming the CEO of Detonix. <laughs> oh, so, it's just, so it's just an advert, is it? <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> basically, it's an advert for his own company's guns. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Oh. Um, you, uh, you picked up the trilogy. I, I, the, I forget the name of it now, ridiculously. It's the main character had three letters in his name. Um, care, chair, care. Q H A, yeah, 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 yeah. You picked up that trilogy, didn't you? As well, I've got the first two. You've got the first two. And funnily, if I did see the third one in the old Pier bookshop, but yeah. it was falling to bits, and he still waited eight quid for it. Ooh. So I thought, no, because actually, it was you who pointed out the um, the eBay listing with the yeah, first yeah. two in really good yeah. condition for a really good price, because they are quite hard to find. Yeah, you, yeah. you picked them up for a really good price, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, just yeah. in in Wales in yeah. uh, Brecon, they're yeah. like two quid each or something. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I, I, I avoid that because I mean I haven't read the first two yet. But have you have you read them now? Well, I've read the first one. Mm. Um, it's good. It's interesting. It's it's it reminds me very much of an English version of um, kind of of like the Illuminatus trilogy by Robert Anton right. Wilson and uh, Robert Shea. Yeah, it's kind it's kind of that vibe, sort of hippie, hippie, hippie vibe, really, uh, with a sort of conspiracy edge to it. Yeah, and mysticism. I, I got the sense when you were talking about it that like the the I don't know how you pronounce it the ke- qu- queer queer queer. queer. The queer, yeah. the queer character, um, is like some kind of weird hippie Doc Savage, yeah, yeah, kind of character. Yeah, maybe the first one of those is something we should do. It's, what we need to do is set up a second bloody podcast, don't we? So yeah. we could just cover all this stuff as well. What I need to do is give up work. Right, we need to win the lottery, give up work, <laughs> and rather than go and live on an island, yeah. review shit books. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With review shit books with all our lottery winnings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds good. Yeah, maybe one day. Live the dream. Live yeah, the dream. Stay in the shed, read shit books. Oh, God, that is the dream, isn't yeah. it? That is the dream. Well, you know what? We shall just have to dream away, and maybe one day it'll happen. But in the meantime, we'll just have to think of what our next one is going to be, because, of course, we've got a few options. But thank you for dropping by Derry and Tom's to talk about the fungus. Thank you, Paul, for recommending it. It was definitely worthwhile and an interesting read and an entertaining read. And we'll think of something else to read further down the line and we'll catch up again. Brilliant. Thanks, Andy. Always a pleasure. Cheers, Graham. And uh, just final note, this watermelon pale ale is actually all right. This is a bit sickly. Uh, Yeah, maybe I'll avoid it then. One can's okay. Mm. No more than that, I think. I say maybe I'll avoid it. I've got to try it. I've just got to try try it. it. But anyway, peace out. Massive thanks once again to Graham for joining me and Derry and Tom's. By the time we got this episode out, Graham's Kickstarter has concluded, but we will give further information down the line re how to get a hold of it, so watch this space. We had a comment on YouTube recently from Paul Mears on our Tales from Strange Cupboards episode. Paul said, Just discovered your podcast tube today, and I'm loving everything about them. Some Hawkwind outro intro music, great guests, excellent subjects, etc. I'm an old head gamer like you folks, and I appreciate your stories of gaming in the way back. Thanks, Paul. We're so pleased you found us. As it happens, whilst we do have a bit of Hawkwind in the shows in the form of the Song of the Swords, the intro and outro music is by Loz's old band Giant Kind, and you can find some of their gear on Bandcamp. And on the gaming point, in the coming weeks I'm dusting off my GM crash helmet and running a couple of Black Sword hack sessions for a group of special guests. More on that in a future show. And, by the time this goes out, the recording of that session may well be on the Patreon page as a patron exclusive. Thanks also to Alistair Davison for this stellar five-star review on Apple Podcasts titled Inspirational. Alistair says, This is a great podcast, presented by an amiable host whose love for his subject shines through. Books, RPGs, and even beers are covered. It's accessible even to someone like me who's only read a handful of Moorcock books, which will, of course, change. It was the War of the Worlds episode that hooked me, their words echoing my thoughts on the various interpretations of that story, and I've stayed ever since. This was going to be a long review, but please just listen to this podcast and decide for yourself. If, like me, you're a reader and writer of fantasy fiction, you won't be disappointed. Thanks again, Alistair. We love reviews, particularly good ones. And naturally, thanks as always to our patrons. First, those without tear. Anthony Paconti, Tim Cardos, Dave Dempster, and Sebastian Weetabix. And to our chaos engineers, Andrew Cicluna, Andrew Van Ness, Anthony Porter, Benjamin Fletcher, Brandon Mays, Craig Ledley, Dave Griffiths, Dave Voxman, Gabriel Laycock, Harvey Faulkner Aston, Jim Kirkland, Jim Knight, John W. Lays, Jules Lawrence, Mal Pertwee, Mary Catherine, Matt Saltz, Menyon, Nelbert, Paul McRandall, PJ Cooper, Scott Butler, Simon Perrins, and Tony Milazzo. And of course, thanks to our crafty jugaderos, Alexander Harris, Loz, Taylor, Matthew Broom, Toby White, Graham Holden, and Ray Otis. And finally, eternal thanks to our patron demons. Alistair Davison, 
Andy Darby, Clarky the Cruel, Dave Lee, Fred Keish, Gareth Wilson, Greg Faulkner, Gwen Barlow, Ian Stead, Imria, Janie Stim, Jay Reesa, Joe Monty, Jason Vogel, Lee Gary, Liam J, Mark Hebden, Miles Reed Lobato, Mort Main, Neil Burton, Paul Hillary, Randall Gatlin, Steve Round, Tom Murphy, the OG patron Norman Beresford, and last, of course, never ever least, Robert McMillan. Okay, enough yakking. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us at breakfastruins at outlook.com. The webpage is breakfastintheruins.com. We have our Patreon page too. There are a few extra odds and sods on there. But for now, take care, stay safe, and we will meet again soon on the Moonbeam Rods. Mm-hmm.